the old time-worn days of the Southern Appalachians was often overshadowed by its Wild West counterpart. Americans with disposable income in the 50s and 60s loved the Wild West. So the theme park planners in the Smokies tried to make a 19th century frontier world even more iconic. A lot of early amusement park and tourism success was built on the back of Wild West themed attractions. Long ago, past when Dolly Parton made the mountain amusement style popular, and before charming old timey novelties, like the spooky abandoned mine rides, Dollywood's grounds went through different owners and by a few other names. A more exotic premise was being explored in the north end of Pigeon Forge, on what is now called the island, a natural land section in the middle of the Little Pigeon River, parallel to the Pigeon Forge Parkway. An idealized representation of South Pacific culture that was being exploited through restaurants and bars steadily became a more prevalent theme in the world as early as the 30s. But it was in the giddy days of the post-war boom that Hawaii, which became a state in 1959, became a cultural obsession. Hawaiians are known for their friendly aloha spirit, so perhaps Porpoise Island was a perfect fit to the southern hospitalities of the Smokies. Porpoise Island was a 20-acre Polynesian-themed attraction in Pigeon Forge that lasted from 1972 to 1984. Ten groups of imported Hawaiian entertainers educated in traditional dance and song from Kamehameha School did hula dances with 20 shows a day involving animal performances with an imported bird show called Island Whiz Kids a tame exotic deer ranch, sea lions and porpoises in a 100 by 36 foot saltwater facility. Visitors were greeted at the main building with a warm hula dance comprised of male and female dancers using real Polynesian instruments and costumes. It was an appealing place where the warmth of the Hawaiian Islands met the warmth of the Smoky Mountains. Porpoise Island was the first Pigeon Forge attraction to use electronic media or television commercials to promote their business. The porpoises are calling you is a well-known tag that many joked about, which in turn promoted the park. The achievement was a great task considering the limits and time zone challenges of landline telephone and the slowness of postal exchanges.
1961, Rebel Railroad opened at Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. That part came about when a family turned a locomotive abandoned by a logging company into an attraction that was modeled after Tweetsie Railroad in Blowing Rock. Inspired by the centennial anniversary of the Civil War, the train ride let visitors experience attacks by Union soldiers, train robbers, and Native American ambushes. The train and its riders were protected by Confederates who fought off the attacks. I grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee in the 70s and early 80s. This Rebel Railroad is actually what is at Dollywood right now. In the 70s, maybe the 60s, the park expanded to include a mountain town with various rides, attractions, and stores. And they had a train depot where you took a ride on a steam engine train into the mountains. Where Dollywood is built now, in the 60s, was a tourist attraction called Rebel Railroad. All the kids were handed toy guns while boarding the railroad cars. Then the train began a ride back into the mountains. At certain stops on the trip, Yankees would attack the train, firing blanks from real guns. The kids were all supposed to shoot the Yankees from inside the train. Finally, the train was stopped at a sort of roadblock, and the bad Yankee soldiers would actually board the train. Right when it looked like all was lost, the Confederate cavalry rode up and retook the train with shootouts in the aisle. One of the retreating Yankees had his pants shot off, exposing bright red long underwear as he ran off into the woods. Even though historically the region was sympathetic to the Union side of the Civil War, I bet that tourists from Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, etc. got a wonderful impression of the Smoky Mountains from this outstanding attraction. They don't make them like Rebel Railroad anymore. It featured a general store, blacksmith shop, and saloon. The showpiece of Rebel Railroad was the coal-fired steam train known as Klondike Katy. Visitors still enjoyed the five-mile train ride into the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, complete with mock Indian attacks and train robberies. The special appeal of each train ride was the possibility that Federal troops might spring from the underbrush, board the train, and steal a strong box full of Confederate money. Promotions encouraged children to bring weapons and help fight off marauding Yankees. The progressive Cleveland Browns football team owner, Art Modell, would be the next one to change the name. Under Modell's ownership, 
Rebel Railroad became Gold Rush Junction and added a log flume ride, an outdoor theater, and the Robert F. Thomas Church in 1973. It cost less than $35,000 to build the Robert F. Thomas Chapel that still stands today. Horseshoes with Gold Rush Junction and Rebel Railroad printed on were some of the souvenirs kids would get along with gems from the Pan for Gold Station. A nearby competitor was the Maggie Valley Railroad, another train ride type tourist attraction that is now gone. In 1976, Jack and Pete Hershen bought Gold Rush Junction, and in 1977, renamed it Silver Dollar City, Tennessee, as a sister park to their original Silver Dollar City near Branson, Missouri. I visited many times as a child and continue to visit the area with my family. It was originally Rebel Railroad, and I still have pics and souvenirs from that time. Then became Gold Rush Junction, Silver Dollar City, then Dollywood. When it was Rebel Railroad, all I remember was the train ride, a small gift shop, and a snack bar. If I am not mistaken, the train at Dollywood is still the same train. My granny and papa used to take us there in the 1960s, and they lived in the area before Gold Rush Junction was there. Got one great picture of me and my little brothers. It is now Dollywood. Granny and papa are related to her somehow or another. I liked it better the old way. My family and I spent a week at Pigeon Forge in June 1968. At that time, Gold Rush Junction was just off the main four-lane highway that connects Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg, which is now the parkway. We rode the train and witnessed the train robbery and the gunfight. The actors would fall over dead. At one point, the train conductors gave out little rifles to the children so they could join in the fight. My son was one of them. He started to run out there but turned around and came back. I asked him what was the matter and he said breathing real fast. I ran out of bullets. Later they moved Gold Rush Junction to where Dollywood is now and it was called Silver Dollar City. We went there and another of my sons fed the organ music peddlers dancing monkey some food. And my daughter helped the blacksmith make a horseshoe which he let her keep. At that time, the only things in Pigeon Forge were a couple of motels and two souvenir shops. One with a replica of an old farming community out back, called the Village of 1800, a restaurant, a drive-in movie theater, a camping site, and the old mill. I don't know if there was a Gold Rush Junction in Maggie Valley or not, but I do know that there was one in Pigeon Forge. It then became Silver Dollar City and later changed to Dollywood. I know this for sure because my dad played music there the summer of 1976, and my sister and I went to work with him many, many times. It was supposed to be like an old western town. I used to love riding the train and helping the Rainmaker put on his show, but my favorite part was the saloon show. It was really fun. Gold Rush Junction was indeed in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, because as a child I swam for a swim team they had. I was a Gold Rush guppy. Our suits were one piece black and gold stripes. It was later Silver Dollar City and then Dollywood. I do remember in Gold Rush Junction that the train would be stopped and held up. I have a black and white picture of me sitting behind what are supposed to be jail bars. Many good memories of summers spent in the Smokies. My grandfather owned Trenum's Hardware 
and my uncle Hobie had two restaurants, two hotels, and part owner of the Space Needle. Before it was renamed Dollywood, it was called Silver Dollar City. But before that, in the mid-late 70s, between the incarnations of Rebel Railroad and Silver Dollar City, it was also known as Gold Rush Junction. My grandparents lived in the Gatlinburg area, and I went to Gold Rush Junction and the renamed Silver Dollar City a couple of times as a kid. There was a train ride that featured an assault, a holdover idea from the Rebel Railroad days, by a group of park employees pretending to be outlaws holding up the train. They stormed the cars wielding fake guns and threatened to kill everyone on board and take their money and such, and were eventually overpowered by the train conductor and crew. I remember Silver Dollar City very well. I made friends with several of the train robbers back in my youth, and to this day I miss the park, and a whole bunch of the robbers that made us all laugh. From the Rainmaker to all the rides, especially the Blazing Fury, it is some of the best memories that I have from those vacations in Pigeon Forge. When Silver Dollar City became Dollywood, we went to go check it out. Being season pass holders of Silver Dollar City in years past, we thought maybe the park was even better. We were so wrong. All the old crew was gone, and no one was even friendly among the many employees. They took away the flooded mine, and they took away the inventor's mansion, and inserted Dolly Parton's family junk instead. We looked around, looked at each other, and left. Yes, they gave us our money back, because we were not at all happy. My dad loved to play skee-ball, and the operators of the game allowed him just one prize, a very tiny, sick-looking stuffed bear, and they told him that was all he was allowed to play. Yes, I miss Silver Dollar City, the fun times, my old pals, and the laughter. Alex Dolly Parton was just 15 years old when a pair of enterprising Robbins brothers from Blowing Rock, North Carolina, expanded their mountain locomotive tourist operation to Tennessee. The Silver Dollar City Amusement Park had an authentic stagecoach and a similar ride to the mystery mine called the Flooded Mine. In 1986, Dolly Parton, who grew up in the area, bought an interest in Silver Dollar City. Dolly became co-owner, and the park reopened for the 1986 season as Dollywood. In 2010, Parton said she became involved with the operation because she always thought if she made it big or got successful at what she had started out to do that she wanted to come back to her part of the country and do something great. Something that would bring a lot of jobs into the area. They built the Rivertown Junction area the first year, which included Smoky Mountain River Rampage, a whitewater rafting ride, 
Back Porch Theater, Aunt Granny Dixie Fixin's Restaurant, and Dolly's Tennessee Mountain Home, a replica of Parton's childhood home. The historic Rebel Railroad steam-powered train is now called the Dolly Wood Express and is operated by two steam engines, Cinderella and Klondike Katie. And passengers get to enjoy the fresh mountain air of the Great Smokies as the train goes passing by old-timey sites like cabins, simulated homesteads, and other pleasant structures with the nostalgic smell from the fumes of the coal embers. In 1992, they added the seven acre Show Street area. In 1993, Fun Country became the county fair, which emulates a year round fair with the Ferris wheel and the usual components of a fair, as well as a great tilt a whirl. The atmospheric Tennessee tornado replaced the old Thunder Express, which got sold to Magic Springs Theme Park in Arkansas. The Dollywood Boulevard area was added in 1996. It included Thunder Road, a turbo simulator ride based on the 1958 movie of the same name. Next to classic auto-themed rides, namely Lightning Rod, the world's first launched wooden coaster, as well as the fastest wooden coaster in the world. One of the originals in the vast array of restaurants included Silver Screen Cafe, a 1950s cinema-themed restaurant that later became DJ Platters in the Dollywood Boulevard area, appearing as a vintage-inspired square with the retro diner. The area had the You Pick Nick children's show focused on themes from the Nickelodeon television network and played in celebrity theater. The flooded mine Dark Ride was closed and demolished in October. A new Shoot the Shoots Flume Ride opened in the area formerly occupied by the flooded mine a year later in 1997. Plenty of more changes occurred in the amusement park in the years to follow with conversions, removals, and additions in the 11 themed areas. Many attractions focus on the history and culture of the Southern Appalachian region as a whole. There's a lot of animals contained in Dollywood, namely the large Eagle Mountain Sanctuary, 1.5 million cubic feet naturally landscaped outdoor aviary provides a home to the world's largest presentation of non-releasable bald eagles and the Wings of America Birds of Prey show. There's also the Stampede Theater. It's said they use the sound of the whip to encourage the animals to move. The acclaimed grist mill was built in 1982. It was the first fully operational grist mill built in Tennessee in more than a century. It looked so authentic, many believed it to have been much older. And quaint country structures to take pictures all over the park. In Craftsman's Valley is the Calico Falls Schoolhouse, a one-room schoolhouse that offers a glimpse to how many East Tennessee schools appeared in the late 19th century. Dolly's Tennessee Mountain Home the two-room replica of Dolly's Locust Ridge childhood home in Rivertown Junction is not far from the Smoky Mountain River Rampage, which opened as one of the flagship attractions at Dollywood in 1986. Even 30 plus years later, this artificial whitewater ride allows holiday makers to cool off on hot summer days. Along with Splash Country and a number of massive resorts and lodges owned by Dollywood. Stop. 
In the particularly rustic Mountain River Rampage aquatic ride, groups get in a round floating craft, which seats six people, and carries them down a mechanical man-made rapids with waterfalls and rushes and rocky siding with a fence along the artificial stream. Join the fun and shoot a water cannon at the visitors on the interactive ride. Almost every ride has a kind of small legend or something unique about it. Thunderhead is known for giving you a crick in your neck with abrupt jerks on the wooden roller coaster. Near Thunderhead, in Timber Canyon, lies Mystery Mine, heavily themed as a haunted mining operation from the 19th century. The cues to the rides include a vast array of immersive sights and sounds. Mystery Mine, for example, includes quick-paced banjo music, dynamite noises, and miners' evil laughs, among many other ominous sounds. In the Christmas time, there are great cheerful lights and decorations, and there's a festival in the summer with Wildwood Grove. The newest ride is Big Bear Mountain. Lots of souvenir shops, including a candle maker, a genuine blacksmith, and a glass blowing shop, where even employees have been injured by blowing glass before. Upon exiting, you will have to make a stop at the Emporium where you can have your items you purchased at any of the shops forwarded and ready for pickup when you leave, and a significant amount of goods, souvenirs, and gifts can be purchased inside. There are shuttles that take visitors to the numerous parking sections. Dolly still owns part of the park, but is substantially owned by Hershend Family Entertainment. The ever-changing park is still expanding today. Guests can find nods to the park's past throughout Dollywood, like the Silver Dollar City sign on the Blazing Fury Dark Ride. One theme park that didn't get to prosper as long as it should in Pigeon Forge, directly because of Dollywood's 90 surge, was Magic World. It operated from 1971 to 1996 in Pigeon Forge. There were parts of Magic World that would maybe get cancelled today. The Land of Arabian Nights, for instance, had a ride that carried passengers in a similar style to Disney's Peter Pan ride, over assorted dioramas that featured scenes from the classic 1001 Arabian Nights, and a few Middle Eastern stereotypes. Magic World also had the Confederate Critter Show, a Chuck E. Cheese style animatronic show featuring a variety of characters dressed up as Confederate officers. General Cornelius Bear Patch spins his yarns, strums his guitar, and sings mountain ballads to the banjo picking of Colonel Stonewall J. Fox and Major Mosby Greyhound III playing his rinky tink piano. In 1979, the Magic World theme park was a treasure of its time. Nestled in between the Car Museum and the Twin Water Skidoo, across from the Police Museum and just down from Porpoise Island. Imagine being on the set of a late 50s sci-fi movie, and at the entrance, there was a 100-foot volcano that held an 80-foot freshwater aquarium to the Dinosaur Museum. The Dragon Train took you through Dinosaur Valley inhabited by gigantic stylized dinosaurs where you could get your picture taken with a woolly mammoth. There was a haunted castle with Frankenstein, Dracula, and a Phantom of the Opera-like specter and a menacing executioner known as the Mad Headsman. Magic World was a wonderful relic of the past comparable to Disney World for children of the 70s and early 80s if they were the right age to see through the cheesiness and appreciate it. Frankenstein conquers the world. From the haunted castle, it was a short walk to the flying saucer, a strange metallic spaceship piloted by beings from the red planet Mars, a panoramic film tour of the Great Smoky Mountains with scenes soaring over Clean Man's Dome and diving under Fontana Lake, played inside the spaceship very refined for the 70s. 
the main attraction in Magic World was Merlin the famed wizard, a performer wearing a giant head stolen from the set of H.R. Puffin Stuff, showcased feats of magic with a variety of assistants at Merlin's magic show. Nearby lied the land of Arabian Nights, which featured the magic carpet ride, a family favorite. There was a dragon coaster and the Red Baron ride, as well as bumper boats and a tilt-a-whirl. The competition was fierce with Silver Dollar City, which had rechristened itself to Dollywood in 1986, and in the 90s, things became difficult as parties involved could not reach an agreement after a dispute over the cost to lease the land. In 1996, Magic World closed. Pieces of Magic World, the volcano and part of the original ship, are still in Professor Hacker's Lost Treasure Golf and Pigeon Forge. A plaque is on display at the mini golf course that honors the original creator of Magic World and Professor Hacker's, James Sidwell. In memory and honor of James Q. Sidwell Sr., Big Jim. Subject of an ongoing lawsuit sits atop Buck Mountain with a top elevation of 4,650 feet. Ghost Town is promoted as North Carolina's Mile High theme park with staged gunfights, a tilt a whirl, a scrambler, bumper cars, merry go round, and the Red Devil cliffhanger roller coaster. An unusual aspect of this park is that it's located atop a mountain with visitors' access being limited to a 5,570-foot-long chairlift or an inclined cable railway. Using land vehicles proved too difficult. Ghost Town was the brainchild of R.B. Coburn, a Covington, Virginia native who moved to Maggie Valley, North Carolina. Originally, it was planned that the park would be placed between the towns of Waynesville, North Carolina and Clyde, North Carolina but future owner Alaska Presley wanted it on the mountaintop. Local investors provided much of the needed capital for the park in the form of unsecured credit bonds in 1959. The name of the park was provided by the child of one of the investors. Ghost Town Village was designed by Russell Pearson and was constructed for approximately $1 million in 1960. Inspired by Coburn's trips to the West. This was 14 years before the movie Westworld. They had mannequin and prop exhibits in some buildings. Over 200 locals helped construct the 40 replica buildings that comprised the western town located at the mountain's peak. About 120,000 square feet of building were constructed using 300,000 feet of lumber. 200,000 feet of plywood, and 20,000 pounds of nails. 620,000 people visited Ghost Town each year, and averaged about 500,000 per year, with the chairlift moving 1,200 people per hour. The park became a major economic driver for the town in the 1960s through 1986. The park was sold in 1973 to National Services for a stock swap. The park suffered under this ownership as the small park was not a major concern for the company. In 1982, performers performed at the World's Fair in Knoxville, Tennessee. And in 1983, country music stars, including Mel Tillis, Reba McIntyre, and the Statler Brothers performed at the park. In 1984, a roller coaster was planned, sponsored by Coors Beer, at a cost of $1 million. It went under in 2002, but attempts were made to revive it. The rebranded park was to feature played gunfights, the chairlift, Appalachian-themed gift shops, zip lines, a museum, a paintball course, an arcade, and horseback riding. 
but the repair costs were just too high. Yet another reopening was set for spring 2019 with a planned expansion and a renaming to Appalachian Village. But the passing of Alaska Presley, vandalism, and investors' extensive plannings being unmet because of grandiose expectations ruined the property. Once the largest water park in the area with six giant water slides, Ogles Water Park was built in the 1970s. A wave pool, a kids play area, and snack stations all around. Slides like the Riptide Water Slide, the Twin Twister, and the Hydro Chute. A fully enclosed tunnel slide introduced in the early 1990s were revolutionary for their time. Ogle's early mechanical wave pool may have even inspired Splash Country's current wave pool. But had Ogle's been built earlier during the tourist boom, the water park would have had the charm and style of previous decades. Had it come later, it would have had the advantages of modern design, things like green areas and shade. It would have come with a more aesthetic concept. Unfortunately, a chain link fence was all that separated Ogles from the parkway, making for a kind of dystopian view to look through from the park and the opposite for the drivers on the other side. Today, Paula Dean's Lumberjack feud sits in its place. Another nearby aquatic attraction was Tommy Bartlett's Water Circus. Established in 1976, next to US Highway 441, with 110 acres of farmland, a 20-foot tall dam was built to hold 8.5 million gallons of water to form the man-made Gatlinburg Lake. And 25,000 pounds of steel was used to construct the 4,500 seat stadium. The water circus in Pigeon Forge began with a parade of boats and was followed by water skiing acrobatics, ballet, trapeze artists, trampoline acts, a juggling comedian, and even a water skiing clown named Aqua. One of the main events was the Helicopter Trapeze Act, which featured Dave Merrifield, a trapeze artist, flying and swinging about while suspended from a helicopter. Merrifield helicoptered coast to coast and was featured on national television. As an 11-year-old, he practiced every day on a homemade trapeze, suspended from a backyard tree. Tommy's featured Rudolph Del Monte, a handsome as a Greek god contortionist extraordinaire who came from a long line of show business performers. Slapstick comedy routines came courtesy of the Huntsicker Botsford Trampoline Comedy Act. The duo showed off their athletic ability as they entertained the crowd with corny jokes. Water skiers from all over the country would come to perform at the water circus in Pigeon Forge with performers from Texas to Connecticut. And yet the Tommy Bartlett's water circus only operated in Pigeon Forge from 1978 to 1982. Tommy operated and directed the water circus himself, having quit his education before high school, becoming a pilot during World War II and flying instructor in the War Training Service. Then as a Northwest Airlines pilot from 1943 to 1947. The show started touring in 1952. The first show appeared in Madison, Wisconsin, and the next was in Wisconsin Dells. The show consisted of two tow boats, four jumping boats, a pickup boat, a few trucks and trailers, and 12 men and women who doubled as skiers and boat drivers. 
The show ran for 26 years in Wisconsin Dells before Bartlett brought it to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. The company sold the Pigeon Forge attraction to finance Tommy Bartlett's Robot World, a $2.5 million investment that planned to display an array of motion androids. Today, that investment is known as the Tommy Bartlett Exploratory, an interactive science center with more than 175 hands-on exhibits. Currently operating in Wisconsin Dells, near where the water circus continued until the coronavirus slowed it to a halt. Bartlett himself only reportedly water skied once in his life on his 70th birthday. Bartlett passed away in 1998 at the age of 84. The canopy of the Pigeon Forge water circus is still rusting in place on Sugar Hollow Road. The lake has been filled and Life Changers International Church sits nearby. Tommy Bartlett's water circus is still fondly remembered by those who were lucky enough to catch a glimpse in the 60s through the late 80s. Around the Smokies, the mountains themselves are about the only thing that is sure to remain constant. Turn to TV45's primetime movie and let a man of few words put some excitement into convention week.
Robert Bradley, Ghost Town in the Sky's most famous gunfighter, who goes by the stage name Apache Kid, received a three inch deep wound from an unknown object launched from a gun that used blanks. And the piece which embedded itself deeply into the Apache Kid's leg was called a powder burn by Alaska Presley. Apparently it was a horrifying sight and people rushed to help the Apache Kid who was bleeding profusely. Evidently, the water had been shut off for some reason and no one could wash Bradley's blood off. He was taken off the mountain and rushed to the hospital, and once he was asked to consent to a drug test, he refused. The park's owner, Alaska Presley, fired the Apache kid under the condition that he could come back if he took his drug test. Two other gunfighters were fired because of the incident. This stirred up a bit of local controversy as the Apache Kid was one of the most well-remembered and longest-serving gunslingers working at Ghost Town, and was even considered one of its key performers. The Apache Kid worked for no pay when the park hit its lowest point. Robert Bradley proudly stood by Presley as she purchased the park. The controversy continues to this day on social media with the fake Facebook account portraying themselves to be the phantom spirit of Ghost Town, with the username RB Coburn, which is the deceased original owner of Ghost Town in the Sky. There are accounts that claim Ghost Town in the Sky was inspired by Echo Valley's owner, Harry Stewart. Coburn came to Maggie Valley and spent about a week with him. While he was rocking his chair out on the porch one night, Harry told the man that there was a gold mine sitting there in that mountain. Coburn asked him what he was talking about, and Harry explained his idea for Ghost Town. He said that people would come in from everywhere to visit a park like that. R.B. liked the idea and stayed over until the next day. They walked up the mountain because there was no road there then. And R.J. told Harry he would help finance it if Harry would build it. So that winter they started building about all the money Harry had put into it, which may not have amounted to much. But this man seemed very wealthy. While they were building it that winter, it began to snow and sleet. Harry began to be afraid of his own project then, and said he hoped that they didn't lose all they owned. R.B. told Harry if he wanted out, he would buy him out, and that is what he did. During his involvement with Ghost Town, Stewart had purchased several miles of small gauge rail from the Greenville and Northern Railway, aka the Swamp Rabbit Railroad to create the train tracks for Ghost Town. After selling that amusement park, Stewart approached a group of investors, including Melvin Jared, Cleveland postmaster, local businessman, and author of The Mountaineer of Cleveland, South Carolina, to see about replicating Ghost Town in the Cleveland area, incorporating the abandoned Swamp Rabbit Rails into the park as one of the rides. 
An old band mill site was purchased along the tracks that bordered the Saluda River. The tracks were rebuilt to create a nine mile circuit. They bought steam engine 110 from the old Greenville and Northern Railroad and several cabooses were converted into open air cars. In addition to the train, there was the western town complete with gunfights, a saloon, stores, and a few carnival rides. A chairlift took passengers up over Echo Lake and up to Echo Ridge for a view of the valley, then back down. The cowboys would wait for the train to get to a designated point at which they would rob it and steal the gold. They would then get on horses and ride away from the train into the town where they would come in and be shooting. The sheriff would come out and have a shootout with one of them and they would play dead. Then the undertaker would go out and drag them off and the mourners would come out and mourn. Some would be captured and be taken to a mock hanging. They would shoot the rope and they would all ride off. Every time the park took in a little money, it would go to land bills and they were never able to expand. They didn't have Highway 11 at the time, so they didn't have the traffic that they have today. After four years, they closed up thanks to low profits. Several people on the board who had money extended loans to the park. They sold out, paid all the bills, and liquidated everything. The Echo Valley Western Amusement Park only lasted four seasons, from 1964 to 1968. What can they expect to find? Just a little bit of everything.